Hello, I'm Ben Duffy, senior editor at SureDog.com and a host of several shows on the SureDog Radio Network. I have the pleasure of speaking this evening with Jacob Debitz. Jacob is a lawyer and writer based out of Melbourne, Australia, has been a contributing writer for SureDog since 2017, and he recently published a feature article titled How a UFC Imposter Became Australia's First No Holds Barred Event. I think the piece is, without exaggeration, one of the most ambitious, well-crafted, and if you care about the history of mixed martial arts, most important articles I've read on mixed martial arts in the last couple of years, whether on SureDog, whether online, through any outlet. It's a, it's a remarkable piece of work, and tonight it is my privilege to talk to Jacob about that article, uh, pick his brain about the event itself, as well as some of the behind-the-scenes work that went into creating it. Jacob, welcome to the SureDog Radio Network. How are you this evening? I'm doing very well, Ben. Thank you for having me. And thank Hi. you for that introduction. Hey, <laughs> my, my pleasure. What I'd like to do is actually start off, for those who have not read this article yet, by reading the opening paragraph. A UFC event you never heard of took place at the Darling Harbor Exhibition and Convention Center in Sydney on March 22, 1997. Eight fighters from the United States, Brazil, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand converged under the bright lights of the Sydney metropolis for a $25,000 winner-take-all open-weight tournament. The last man standing would receive a novelty check and a belt emblazoned with three words, Ultimate Fighting Championship. When I read this for the first time, I took that first sentence as a challenge. Oh, you, you think there's an event I never heard of that took place in March 1997? Watch me go. And I quickly realized that I did not know the first thing about this event. I, I don't say this to be, like, self-aggrandizing, but I know a lot of MMA history. It's rare for me to come to an event this important and know this little about it. I was in suspense as I read through this, and it came out... Uh, because it's a lengthy article, it came out in five parts, uh, staggered over a, a number of weeks, or staggered over a week, and I was in suspense as each new, as each new article came out. I knew from the Sure Dog Fight Finder that the event did actually take place. It was not shut down by the cops or shut down by yeah. the UFC. But beyond that, like all the details, were uh, all the details were new to me. Mm. What I'd like you to do is. For, for those who were are as in the dark as I was, why is this event important? Why is the event that we now call Caged Combat 1, for reasons we'll probably get to, why, why is it important? Why should they care about this event? I think in the MMA history books that I have in my shelf, there are, there are kind of principles that we're all aware of, hardcore MMA fans are aware of, from that period, in, from 1993 to when Zufa took over. There are all of these potential storylines when people in MMA could have become the market leader, seized control of the future of MMA, and changed it. Um, you had Battlecade, uh, Battlecade Extreme Fighting, run by Don Zuckerman, who was who was cashed up, ambitious, but didn't probably didn't necessarily make all the right decisions, and then that kind of fizzled and burned out. You had SEG, where if if they hadn't used the advertising that they had, or they hadn't pissed off you know, John McCain, or they'd done things a little bit differently, maybe they wouldn't have found themselves in financial peril and had to sell to Zufa. You had uh, the WFA. You have all these principles that people understand and recognize and kind of are familiar with their stories. On the other side of the world, there was a commercial building developer who had a lot of money, or at least he had for, for a time before he pissed it all away on this event. He, had, he potentially had investors. He potentially had a distribution deal with Time Warner and uh, Lionsgate, um, and he had uh, an environment where they could actually put on events um, where in America and, and certain other places in the world that couldn't happen. There's a potential, and I still don't even know it, how much I believe, how much of it is hyperbole or how much of it was uh, a genuine chance that was thwarted. But there is a parallel universe somewhere where Randy Babel, you know, gets through the lawsuits, gets a distributor. And there's an MMA or an NHB franchise in this part of the world that meaningfully changes the future of MMA. Um, and, you know, 
looking at the event, looking at how well it came together um, and, and the careers that it's launched and the sort of punctuation marks on a number of significant figures in MMA um, that it had, it was just this, it was this crazy moment in NHB history that no one had ever written about. This event, this event was literally the only references I found to it were on Reddit, a couple of UG forums, and mummified in mixed martial arts magazines or martial arts magazines that no longer exist anymore. It was so hard to find information on this. But every person I spoke to gave me a new narrative or sub-narrative that when I looked into it, I was like, oh my God, this story just got even crazier. Um, and I'm so fucking happy that I got to be the one to tell this story. Um, so I, I mean, I'm biased. I think it's significant, but I think historically um, it's difficult to look at this and not kind of be persuaded that A, this should have been in the history books to begin with, and B, there's a parallel universe out there where, where Randy Babel is not someone who was forgotten, um, but someone who is actually a very significant figure in, in the sport we now know as mixed martial arts. That's very well said. I, I, I watched the event and mm -hmm. I was shocked at how good it was. And I'm not even yeah. talking about the actual fights because the yeah. actual fights varied in quality. It was a very totally. mid to late nineties event, but the totally. production values yeah. were roughly comparable with what the UFC was doing at the time. I was totally. shocked by that because as I, I didn't watch it until I was done reading the article. And as yeah. I uh, kind of read the story of Randy Babel, mm -hmm. I kind of expected that when I saw the event, I would be disappointed. Like, okay, this looks like some Mickey Mouse shit that, you know, some yeah. dude did in his garage. Yeah. I was, I was surprised by the quality of it. And it definitely gives it some credence when you think about it as a counterfactual, the, yeah. the way the sport, the way the sport got from 1993 to 2021 it's not some track of destiny. Yeah. The people who are currently in power, the winners who are writing the, the history, yeah, w would like us to believe that was the case, that they, yeah. they pulled this up by their bootstraps and then the tough one finale happened and that was the turning point for the, for the sport. Yeah. But there were many other ways this, this could have gone. You mentioned Randy Babel already. Mm. What those who have not read the article yet should know is, while this tells the story of the event, it is very much an oral history. Uh, yeah. Jacob went to what I can only assume was migraine-inducing amounts of work to uh -huh. get primary source quotes and stories from just about every significant person involved with the event. Would it be fair to say that Randy Babel is the, is the protagonist of this story, that this is his story? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's right. And be because he reminded me so much of Art Davey in the way that he spoke and, and he's kind of like, he's always pitching. This event happened 24 years ago, but he was still trying to sell it to me. That was the wonderful thing. You know, he's talking about, I'm going to have a live band. I'm going to have exotic dancers. It's going to be like the movie Any Given Sunday. He's still selling it. And um, I think that, you know, he had this vision and for one night, he, he kind of realized it against all odds. You know, there were police at Octagon side ready to rip people out of the cage and start taking people out of the bleachers. Um, SEG, rightfully, you know, when you look at the, the primary documents, he was, he was ripping them off. You know, it's absolutely beyond doubt that he saw their IP, he copied it, he, he induced people. In, and, you know, in fairness, it was a very small crowd of people in Australia would have been aware of the UFC and, and, the, and the No Holds Barred community more broadly. But he did absolutely try to copy what they had done in the US and hold it in what he thought would be a more palatable political environment. Um, and, you know, to hear him in his office in Chinatown where someone comes in breathlessly with a copy of, you know, UFC 5 VHS and he watches it. And then two years later, he's literally putting on a, a, a no holds barred event with legit guys. You know, Mario Sperry was a very legitimate no holds barred uh, fighter. He had Vernon White, who was, you know, one of the most experienced no holds barred guys for that era. Um, and to put it on, but also to put his spin on it. You know, he was he was stealing their logos and he was kind of marketing it in the same way that they had. But the actual uh, event with the, the live performance aspect of it, that was something different. He thought, you know, there was no pay-per-view in Australia at the time. So it was more something that he wanted to package into a VHS event and sell as opposed to something that he was selling for a, for a live broadcast. Um, and just everything that he went through on the night and then in the sort of 12 months afterwards where 
it didn't quite come off because of mistakes he made with the distribution deal. You know, they didn't have rights to some music. And he said that, um, I think it was Time Warner, uh, it was like Time Warner or Lionsgate um, who said that they couldn't um, package and, and distribute it um, because they didn't have the rights to a Bon Jovi song that the exotic dancers had used. But he still puts on a second event. He still brings over other UFC vets and other people from Japan. He sells it. It's, it's a whole other thing. And then it just fizzles out. And then he just says, you know, he's like, you know, he's a bit coy about how it impacted him financially. Most people remember him as being, you know, almost financially bereft when this thing happened. He couldn't put on another event in a cage because he couldn't afford to, to um, put, put a cage together. He didn't film. The, he held a sorry, I'm jumping all, all over the place a little bit. But he did hold a second event that was very low key, not many spectators. He said he broke even. Most people speculate that he lost money on it. At least a few contractors, including the referee, say that they didn't get paid. Um, and then he just kind of fades out. You know, he kind of disappears. There was a thread on the underground called, uh, titled, Is Randy Babel Dead? Like he just completely disappeared. He made this incredible impression on the martial arts and combat sports community in Australia. And then he just disappeared. And I found him on Facebook. He's a real estate agent in Tennessee now. And he's got a manuscript for a movie about this event, you know, sitting on, you know, collecting dust in his, in his study. Um, to, a very long-winded answer, but yes, this story absolutely is about Randy Babel. He's such an enigmatic character. And my only wish is that this was successful. He was able to jumpstart a, a NHB franchise down in Australia. And I think our conversation about Oceanic Mitch Martial Arts in 2021 would be very different. Uh, about how much time total or how many on how many occasions did you speak to to Randy while putting this together? So I spoke to him initially before this story was even a, a fraction as big as it ended up getting. I found him relatively early. Um, he was probably my fifth or sixth interview. We spoke for about an hour. He was very, his question, the, the answers to my questions were very broad. He gave me lots of great quotes, but in terms of specifics, I really had to go away, interview like 10 other people and then come to him with it you know, a monolithic list of questions. So I interviewed him the first time, sent him a big long email with follow-ups, and then I interviewed him a second time. And that second interview went for about two and a half hours. Um, and I still followed him up and texted him about a few things. Um, but I spoke to him for probably cumulatively about three and a half, four hours in total. He was very, very giving of his time. Because of that, you probably have some sense of the man even beyond what we would be able to pick up from the text which is substantial in itself but when i think of a story like this just mm. a someone coming out of nowhere to do an ambitious venture that he has really no background in yeah and it was a success in the sense that he put on the event and the quality of, of that event is is good but yeah. a failure in the sense that he may have taken a bath on it financially and obviously yeah. the experiment petered out pretty quickly afterwards. Yeah. The person involved in that kind of experiment, that kind of venture, they usually yeah. seem to fall on some continuum where on one end it's this Forrest Gump type character who's just kind of yeah. a, a good hearted dude who doesn't really know what he's yeah. getting into and just kind of bumbles his way to greatness. And on the other side you have if not diabolical, at least more of a calculating figure. Yeah. Uh, where on that spectrum would you put Randy Babel? I love that spectrum. I've never heard it explained like that, but I totally agree with that sort of characterization. Um, everybody spoke highly of Randy Babel, with the exception of, of the referee who, who you know, called him a snake oil salesman and a, and a couple of other people who kind of had reservations more based on rumors that they'd heard as opposed to, you know, their direct... Um, treatment or relationship with the man. Um, all the fighters loved him. He paid everybody. He, uh, all the fighters at least, he put on a, on a really great event. He's definitely not Forrest Gump. He thought about this really hard. And when you see the rule set, the contracts, the terms in relation to intellectual property and options, he was obviously very intelligent. He had come from, you know, commercial building sector. You, you can't be an idiot and, and succeed in that. And it sounds like he was very successful in that. He'd done live performances. He did, uh, he managed a few Australian musicians who were doing shows in Asia. So he was obviously very commercially savvy, um, probably not for Tita level commercially savvy or, you know, perhaps, well, I mean, you know, they had $40 million to burn. So 
maybe they weren't. <laughs> maybe he was just as savvy as Peters. He just didn't have the money. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if he falls on either of those two extremes. People liked him. I don't think that he wanted to screw anyone over. I think that he was someone who dreamed big. Um, he definitely thought that he could hold an event that would stand the test of time. Um, I don't think that he got into it unawares. I think he did 18 months of due diligence and then put his absolute very best foot forward. But still, it's still eight guys bare knuckle in a cage where there's no sanctioning, there's no infrastructure, nobody's ever seen anything like this. It's literally a copycat of something that was already a precarious bet in the United States and Brazil and Japan where it was taking place. To do it in a place like Australia, which is in a lot of cases a lot, a lot more politically conservative than a place like America, um, was just a huge risk. And I don't know how many people you know, could have done what he did, um, no matter how smart or successful or... Um, acclimatized in the martial arts space. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. He was very smart. I think that he had the best of intentions. I don't think that he was a sociopath or, or someone who was sort of trying to <laughs> calculating and, and taking advantage of people. Um, but like any promoter, you know, he, he probably cut some corners and uh, and I think that he accepts that now. He was quite willing to accept that he ripped off the SEG uh, with the way that he promoted the event. Um yeah, I think I wish, oh man, I wish that he was still in, in MMA. I don't think he follows it very closely anymore. When you went to, to look him up because you decided you wanted to write a piece about this event, did you expect him to still be involved in combat sports in some capacity? No, I, I honestly thought that he might have died because so many people, they all said the same thing. They were like, in 1997, this fast-talking American just became a thing in Sydney from, from, I suppose it would have been sort of mid-1995 to the end of 1997. He literally called everybody in, in uh, martial arts, everybody in boxing, everybody in kickboxing, everybody in Muay Thai. He just harassed people, man. He was, he was reading Blitz magazines, calling gyms, anybody who could, who could teach him something about No Holds Barred, uh, combat sports promotion in Australia, uh, how it was regulated, uh, how, how the commission operated or like he, he just made such an impression on all these people and then after his event failed and he decided that he was not going to pursue this he completely disappeared um, all the promote and I spoke to other promoters who were promoting in like the early 2000s um, like the um, there was the rings an incarnation of rings that happened in Australia there was an incarnation of Pancreas XFC a few other regional shows and I, I for the most part I have relationships with those um, promoters and I asked you do you know who Randy Babel is? Did you speak to him before you started promoting? And they said, I know who Randy Babel is. He's a guy who did this caged combat event. I have never spoken to him. I don't know anybody who's spoken to him. He disappeared off the face of the planet. People thought he died or they thought a lot of people thought that he absconded and went back to the US or, you know, went somebody else to escape the legal bills associated with the SEG lawsuit. Um, but I, I just think he just had enough of it. And um, yeah, just, didn't, didn't do anything else. I did not expect him to be in MMA, though, um, to answer your question. Um, I, did, I expected him to be a property, a real estate agent in Tennessee, <laughs> which is what he is. <laughs> you, you mentioned just now, and you definitely touched on in the article, the networking that he had to do. Mm -hmm. Get, yeah. And it just reminded me that in 1995, 96, 97, there was an internet, but it was in its infancy, and combat sports internet was not even in its infancy. You know, yeah. SureDog is the oldest MMA website still in operation, and it didn't start until uh, mid-1997. And even at that yeah. time, it was really just a repository for Jeff Sherwood's photos. Totally. The, the role that Blitz Magazine played in this is just very funny to me because yeah. the, the want ad sections of those magazines were what we had instead of an internet. I mean, that's how the Gracies in Southern California kind of got their, their Gracie challenge out was through, yeah. you know, ads in the back of uh, Black Belt magazine. It sounds like like Blitz uh, played a similar role to that in, in Australia. I found totally. it interesting that uh, Mark Castagnini, is that his name? Yeah. yeah. He was a manager at Blitz and was actually someone who was on board with this to the point that he served on the commentary team. Yeah. When... A lot. It seems like a lot of the traditional martial arts community was very standoffish about this event. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Did you have a chance to talk to Mark? Like were, were his quotes from dealing directly with him? Yeah. Mark was actually my first interview. Mark, when I spoke to Mark, I think I spoke to Mark before I pitched the series to Josh at that point. It wasn't a series. It was just an article, but speaking to Mark, he was, his enthusiasm for the event was so infectious. I think I already, I always would have written this article. I don't think it would have been as good without Mark's, um, the benefit of Mark's insights because he was everything. He was a championship kickboxer. He was the managing editor of Blitz magazine. He was a budding commentator with Michael Chavello. Um, he's kind of just like at the very core of the martial arts space in Australia in 1997. And he was just able to share insights that nobody else could have because he was just so close to the ground. You know, he knew about every event that was happening in Australia because they were all advertising them through Blitz. He was commentating a lot of them, you know, uh, until shortly before 1997. He was fighting on some of them. Um, so Mark was an absolutely integral part of this story. Um, he's actually, he had a couple of the Blitz magazines. Um, so I went out to his gym, which was thankfully only about 40 minutes from my house. I drove down there. I also read a lot of like Black Belt and other like international kickboxer. Um, so yeah, he was absolutely integral to putting me in touch with people, to giving me primary documents and to providing some, yeah, some really fantastic insights and quotes that was featured in the article. So far, we've talked about two people involved with the event who ended up in the article who sound as though they were ready, willing and eager to talk to you and were generous with their time and their insights. Was there anybody that you wanted to talk to for this that you either couldn't find or they just were not, they didn't want to talk about it or didn't want to go on record about it? Yeah, so thankfully, almost everyone spoke to me eventually. Some people held out for a while, which I'm not sure, you know, it might just be because they were busy. I don't think that they were necessarily trying to avoid me. So it was, it was tough to get Chris Hazen, who's notorious for being quite introverted and doesn't necessarily love talking to media. Um, took me a while even to get Elvis, and I think that was just because he was just busy with other stuff. He owns a gym in Sydney. One guy who, who did not talk to me, who initially agreed to participate in the story, and then for whatever reason, he just went completely dark, was Simon Sweet, um, who was one of the Kiwi kickboxers who fought. Uh, he fought Neil Bodicott for the most of the fight. He kicked the shit out of Neil Bodicott. And then Neil rallied and put on this like Rocky-esque, uh, you know, come from behind um, victory. Um, yeah, Simon agreed to speak to me. And then when I called him at the prearranged time, he didn't answer it. Um, I, I think I probably sent him 10 or so text messages, follow-ups. I called him a few dozen times. I've got other people to pressure him into talking to me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why he ultimately, um, didn't want to speak to me, but yeah, he was the only fighter with the exception of Neil, who, who unfortunately passed away in 1998. All the other fighters in the tournament agreed to speak to me. Most of the managers, um, and consultants, uh, agreed to speak to me, the ring announcer, the referee, the commentators. You know, people who are pretty important, Michael Chavello, he spoke to me for, at length about the, the event. Um, so, yeah. So with the exception of Simon, everyone was very willing and able to, to participate in the story. And I'm very much indebted to them for their time. It's interesting that you uh, that you bring up Chris Hazeman because he, he is a, seems like a, a fairly private person because what you came up with for this article, I think that's as much of his words as I've seen in print in the time yeah. I've been following this sport. And I'm yeah. going to make the executive decision right now to uh, spoil the results of the actual tournament in talking sure. with you. I just figure they can watch it. It's embedded in the article. If they even navigate to the sure dog fight finder page in looking at this, yeah. they're going to instantly see who won. So I'm just going to talk openly about it yeah. and understand that I'm, I'm a Chris Hazeman fan. I think it yeah. is, it is shockingly recently that he stopped being the greatest mixed, uh, mixed martial artist from Australia. Yeah. Like, I think you almost have to wait until Whitaker came along. So yeah. we're talking about, you know, over 20 years, really, yeah. that Chris Hazeman was the greatest Australian mixed martial artist based almost entirely on things he did before 2003. You know, yeah. remarkable fighter. Having said all that, when I watched this thing, he was pretty dirty. I, just <laughs> he didn't come for those, well, who, did the, for those who, <laughs> who don't uh who who are unfamiliar which is going to be 99 percent of you watching this yeah. was a an eight-man tournament so you know four rounds 
he won twice by chin and eye submission. <laughs> uh, and the funny thing is, I've watched, you know, a good number of his fights. He didn't strike me as that type of guy normally. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny. It's funny. There, there was actually a lot more in the original drafts of the article about the chin to the eye submission. Josh very rightfully cut them down. I think he, he the original series, was, I think 22 or 23,000 words, it got down to 16,000 words and he made it so much better. Josh Gross, thank you for um, reining me in um, uh, on that. But you know, that was someone almost every fighter spoke about, often unprompted. They they still had strong opinions about Chris Hazeman's use of the chin, chin to the eye submission. It was something that had been taught to him by his wrestling coach, Bill Porter, who was a uh, sergeant in the Queensland Police Corp. And if you know anything about what, you probably don't know much about it, but anybody from Australia who knows anything about Queensland in the 1990s knows that... <laughs> Cops, uh, cops from from that era in that place um, were pretty hardcore, um, and Bill Porter absolutely looks the part of of, of that. Um, but yeah, he taught Chris this chin to the eye submission. Their position, which I couldn't confirm with people, was that they basically had spoken to the referee and Babel um, about the fact that a chin to the eye submission was not an eye gouge. Eye gouges were illegal according to the rules. Their position was this was not an eye gouge. It was very much a black letter interpretation of the law, absolutely breached the spirit of the rule, which was about protecting people's eyes. But their position was, this was legal. Cameron did not disqualify. Cameron, the referee, did not disqualify Chris when he submitted uh, Hiriwat Rangi and Elvis Sinizic. But Mario Sperry, absolutely, his team said, we're not, we're not fighting with someone who can put their chin to the eye. Everybody agrees there's no way that Chris ever would have been able to maneuver and put his chin in Mario Sperry's eye. BJJ prodigy, you know, had a million Valley two-day fights in Brazil. Um, but it was extremely controversial. The irony is in the final fight, and now I'm giving away spoilers, in the final fight between Sperry and Chris Hazeman, right near the finish, uh, Mario puts his thumb in Chris's eye. You know, it's almost, it's almost kind of that... Uh, you know, level of, you know, it's, it's, it's no holds barred in the 1990s. We think of MMA as fluid because every fight, there's a matchup. Will they make weight? What's, what are the stakes? What are the rankings? Like there's so many intangibles and, and variables that are kind of, um, uh, you know, there's, there's not those structures that exist in other sports. In 1997, they didn't have weight classes. They didn't know if they were wearing gloves. It, there was no guarantee that the fighting surface that they were competing on was reinforced properly. You didn't know if cops were going to come in and start ripping people out. Um, you know, this was just such an incredibly crazy time. And the chin to the eye submission, I think, is such a funny metaphor for what this event was. Um, it was such a, uh, an anomaly, such a blip on the radar for that period of time. Um, yeah, Chris Hazeman. He, he's still passionate when he talks about it now. He's, he's, oh, just imagine what I could have done with my fist. Look at what I did with my chin. You know, that, that, that was like, that was like a subplot in both of their careers for like 15 years later. You know, they almost fought, uh, in 2010 when they were both well past their primes. And that was basically that, that idea of that rivalry was sustained almost entirely because of the way the first fight ended. Um, which is such a fun part of, um, early MMA history in Australia. It, it's funny. And I think it's brilliant that you call it a metaphor for the, the entire event, because on top of everything else, I don't think it made a difference. I think Hazeman would have mm. uh, beaten uh, those two guys probably pretty easily without it. And yeah. I mean, Sperry, the fight was basically over when he did that anyway. It, it didn't yeah. actually come into play in any of the results, Absolutely. but it's even right now, 24 years later, what, what we're talking about. So that, that is pretty funny. I was surprised that uh, you got David Isaacs from Semaphore Entertainment Group to be as forthcoming as he was. Yeah. about how they felt about the Australian event going on. And he seemed to be fairly open even about the difficulties that SEG itself was undergoing at the time. Yeah. And that, that pulls me back to what we opened up with where we were talking about history didn't have to play out the way it did. Just yeah. the way that basically Babel sort of outlasted SEG's lawsuit because yeah. their attorney stopped showing up in court yeah as an attorney 
w- when would you stop showing up in court without any warning? <laughs> well, uh, I currently work for a judge, and uh, I now have more insight on this. Uh, it, it happens. It, it does happen sometimes. Uh, I imagined a primary reason is that they stopped getting paid. I think yeah. SEG probably just hit the end of their war chest and couldn't afford to keep paying their attorneys to fight this podunk event in in Australia anymore. They were probably were having to circle the wagons a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of like the toothpaste was kind of out of the tube. If their lawyers had been slightly more savvy or proactive or Randy hadn't kind of... Because the, the whole sequence was they sent... Uh, SEG sent out cease and desist letters in early March, basically putting them on notice that, you know, we're alleging that you've infringed our trademarks and we're reserving our rights to go to the court and get an urgent injunction. I have no idea. I'm not a trademark lawyer. I don't know what the chances are that they would have been able to get an injunction. But that was really their leverage. The lawyers were negotiating in the background for such a long period of time. It looked like they had reached an agreement about what uh, Babel could and couldn't do in terms of promoting the event and putting the plugs out on the radio and and the other places he was advertising it that was withdrawn literally 24 hours before the event went ahead seg couldn't stop it so really all they're after is they want damages and they want uh corrective advertising out there all of the other stuff they were asking for they want you know permanent injunctions preventing him from using an octagonal cage um permanent injunctions using terms like fighting an ultimate you know in in different you know they were very ambitious and i think that they they really just overdid it because when you want to make claims like that particularly against someone who's represented um they're going to drag it out and unless you want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in court for very little in the way of compensation at the end of it you know the ufc will do that now because they've got seven billion dollars and espn and disney behind them um and it makes sense because it's kind of like putting up barriers to entry and it's not about the short term, you know, any profit they can extract from the person who's using their intellectual property. It's about sending a message to any would be competitor. Don't fuck with our IP or we're going to make your life hell. The SEG in 1997 could barely put on events. They were barely getting people to, to come out and watch the event and buy VHSs. Um, so it was just not a battle that was worth waging for them. Um, and, yeah, that, that, that's where it happened. But David was great. David was extremely um, candid and forthcoming. Um, he helped out. You know, we were trying to get um, certain court documents that the court didn't still hold. They had given back parties their affidavits with attachments. We were trying to find attachments um, to the affidavits, which spoke to, like, how much, how many VHSs the UFC had sold in Australia, what, like, distribution deals they had. Um, and David was really good in trying to get those documents for me from Bob Merowitz and Dave Merowitz and um, Campbell McLaren and those guys. Um, so he was really fantastic. Um, and yeah, I think his perspective on the story is 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 such a invaluable contribution to it because it's, it's just another one of those angles. You know, this was another significant figure that was pulled into this event's orbit. Um, you know, in addition to the Frank Frank Shamrocks and Carlson Gracie C- uh, Carlson. Um, yeah, Carson Gracie Senior. Carson Gracie, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. David was great. Sorry, I, I completely uh, lost track there for a second. You can cut this bit. <laughs> and what I will let the listeners know is that we've talked back and forth a few times here about how they were jacking the UFC's IPs. They yeah. gave gave themselves a name that was too similar. They use some of the the trade dress, like the octagon shaped cage, just to make you aware. And I will put some of the visuals uh, over top of this uh, as we're talking for the final version. This is beyond. And I speak as somebody who I've worked with the Sherdog Fight Finder for years. So I've seen little promotions stealing the UFC's trade dress. I mean, right now, today, in 2021, there is an organization called Arabic Ultimate Fighting Championship, AUFC. Their logo looks exactly like the UFC logo with an A on the beginning. They're, and they're not that small. They're one of the two biggest promotions in Egypt. And for whatever reason, the UFC hasn't chased them down. Yeah. Randy Babel ripped them off worse than that. I mean, (laughs) and again, I'll put this in, I'll put this visual over the screen, but their ad in Blitz magazine, it had 
a somewhat stylized picture of Paul Varlins and Cal Worsham squaring off and fighting <laughs> that was itself yeah. taken from a slightly less stylized version that the UFC itself had used. They just, yeah. I, I actually laughed out loud when I saw their logo and it said, Ultimate Fighting Championship, huge, and then Australasian in about half size font directly yeah. above it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. This is yeah, brazen. And, uh, yeah. 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 It, it was. And, you know, they're really, the way that the editors of Blitz and the, the people who were writing features in Blitz about this story, the way that they almost tried to thread the needle was they spoke about the UFC like it was a sport as opposed to a promoter of a sport. They, they said, you know, the UFC, the sport of UFC is coming to Sydney. The UFC is making its, its Australasian debut. And to someone who was unassuming, I would say 95% of people who read that and who knew what the UFC was, they would think that the UFC was coming down to Australia, that they were going to come and put on an event down here. But really, if you read it really, really, really closely, they just fall short of saying that it's, you know, they certainly never say it's a semaphore entertainment group, um, but they had their fighters, you know, they had people from the UFC tournaments coming down and competing, and that's how they were advertised, you know, from the UFC 1 and UFC 9 tournaments, here's Zane Fraser, uh, you know, there, there were um, Steve Jenkins, um, another guy who's, who's um, escaping me at the moment. So they really were trying to create that association. The logos were so similar. They called it the Ultimate Fighting Championship. They had the muscle man holding the globe, above his head in the center of an octagonal cage. Um, it, was, it was extremely brazen. And, you know, Babel says that the lawsuit didn't really change things. He said that it was really about being able to sell the live event. Um, and I think in this part of the world, that there's, there's a chance that he's right in the sense that it wasn't like the UFC was something super established. You could tweak that formula and probably still uh, get people to buy the VHS and be interested in the product. Um, but there's no doubt that the path of least resistance for him was to rip off the IP and basically just throw a copycat show and, and put his own little tweaks on it, um, which is what he did. And, you know, that's what we're talking about. It's, I'm glad that you brought up Zane Frazier. Obviously, Zane Frazier, the gigantic kickboxer who participated in uh, the first UFC and UFC 9, he was, he was part of the event to the point that he was – in Australia on fight week, mm. uh, according to him, I guess, pulled a muscle running up on the beach and pulled out within like two days before the, the event. I would love to know what other story there is to this because the event was, uh, took place on March 22nd. So according to the timeline, it sounds like March 19th or 20th or, or so he pulled out on March 28th. He fought in the one night tournament on tribal casino land in New York state. I, I wonder, and I have no idea, but I wonder if, yeah. if he got cold feet, he was worried he wasn't going to get paid or he got a better offer that maybe he took to Babel and Babel couldn't or wouldn't match at, at the 11th hour. But yeah. I, I'd love to catch same Frazier sometime and find out if he'd even tell the truth about it. Uh, like what actually happened. Yeah. Vernon White had some interesting theories about this. So actually, when you asked before, if anyone didn't agree to speak to me, I was unable to get onto Zane. Um, but in terms of him pulling out of the event, uh, Mr. Vernon White said that he had initiated Zane when in the Lions Den. I think that he trained with them for a time. And then he was out there with uh, Richard Hamilton and Mark Kerr and Mark Coleman and stuff like that. That's where he was training for this event. Um, and Zane Fraser said that, uh, sorry, uh, Vernon White said that Zane had explicitly asked not to be put in the same bracket as Vernon uh, and that maybe he pulled it out because he knew that he couldn't be. But, you know, that's, that's Vernon's recollection. And, you know, obviously it suits Vernon's <laughs> version of events where he's the reason that, you know, 280 pounds Zane, Zane Fraser doesn't compete in the, in the tournament. But um, no, that, that was not something that I have any particular insights, uh, just a couple of rumors, none of which I could verify, unfortunately. Well, it's a shame that he didn't make it into the cage that night because having trained with Mark Kerr, he at least would have been well prepared for the chin and eye submission and he might have been able to counter it. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that would that would have made it a really hard um, bracket for Mario because he was supposed to fight uh, Simon Sweet. I think he would have beaten Simon Sweet. 
um, and then he would have fought the winner of Vernon and Mario. I think Mario probably would have beaten Zayn, but still that would mean that Mario would beat Vernon, Zayn, and then Chris Hazeman. And Chris Hazeman got to fight a kickboxer with no ground game in, in Hiriwa, which he took out in 50 seconds. Elvis, who's, who's a great grappler for that period of time in Australia, but he, was, he probably was about 30 or 40 pounds lighter than Chris Hazeman, and then he would have fought Mario. So that, you know, that could have very well changed the end result of the tournament um, if Zane had competed in it, but it also would have meant potentially that we wouldn't have had a, a fight of the night because um, Neil wouldn't have competed, and that fight between Neil and Simon was one of the, possibly one of the best fights of that era, I think, just in ter- not in terms of technique or anything like that, but just in terms of the, the heart and the, the tenacity of uh, Neil. Um, yeah. Neil, Neil was a real, I'd love to speak more about Neil actually at some point during this, this podcast, because a lot of the stuff about him um, didn't end up, didn't, didn't end up in the final cut of the article. And he seemed like a really important unheralded figure in Australian martial, mixed martial arts. Well, let me ask one more thing and then let, let's pivot to that. Yeah. It was Fraser's withdrawal that opened up the door for Matt Rocca to enter, correct? No, so uh, there were three alternates. It was Elvis, Matt, and Neil Bodicott. Uh, there was a whole bunch of people who withdrew at different times, making way for Matt and Elvis. So they got the call about two or three weeks before the event, confirming that they were in the final bracket of the tournament. Zane Fraser pulled out two days beforehand, and Neil, who was a self-taught grappler and karate guy, he stepped in on two days' notice for Zane. Got it. And But Matt was the one who apparently supplied you the original documents of the rules from that night from his contract. How crazy that he has his contract still from 24 years later. I couldn't well, believe it. I was so happy. I, I assumed, I imagined when I saw that, and you'll have to either confirm or dispel this for me, that when you contacted him, he was like, I've been waiting for 24 years to talk to somebody about this. I can't wait. Like, was he eager to, to talk about his experience? I just, I couldn't believe he still had the, yeah. the photocopied rules. He is the, qui- like, he is the stereotypical Canadian. He is so goddamn polite and nice and forthcoming. Like, he was so... We had such a long conversation. He was so effervescent about that period of time. Because remember... He was a young boy in the Lions then. He was only at the academy for, I think, about nine months. He trained for six or nine months for this event, and then shortly after its conclusion, he withdrew. He competed again in, in Canada in mixed martial arts, I think, a, a couple of years later. But you know, his career, if you can call it that, in No Holds Barred, basically was, was, this, was this one year, and then he went back to university, and now he's a cop in Ontario. Um, so I think more so than other fighters, this was just kind of a, a small part of his life that is the subject of, you know, he's got his memorabilia, he's got T-shirts, he's got all that kind of um, stuff that he collected for that era, and it's kind of in this, um, uh, what's it called when you put things in the ground and then you take it out? Time capsule? Like, it's like a time capsule, right? It's like this time capsule of stuff from that, you know, one year of his life where he's a professional cage fighter, and then he went back and had a very normal life. Um, although he's still, he's still, he's a BJJ black belt, I believe. And he's, he's thinking of starting an academy, but yeah, I think that's the reason why he held on to his contract because it was this very self-contained part of his life. Whereas the Vernon Whites and Mario Sperry's and, um, Elvis Sinizic and Chris Hazeman's, you know, they've had dozens of contracts over the years and they're not necessarily keeping all of them, um, in a time capsule like Matt did. Let's, uh, turn and talk about, uh, about body cut a little bit. In watching the event, kind of watching all, all the fights, and this is no reference to his skills or at all, but he's the yeah. guy that looked like, okay, they pulled someone out of the crowd. Absolutely. Obviously, he's somebody that you, you couldn't get for primary source material for this. Did you know that he had passed away when you started this? Like, did you know that he was, he was dead? I learned pretty early. Um, I think it may have even been Mark who told me about it. Um, yeah, he passed away very tragically in 1998. He took his own life. Um, he, he, he hung himself. He was found by his, um, girlfriend. Um, and, and in the article, in the first, the, the original draft of the article in the the aftermath article, part five, I did speak quite substantively about, uh, the fact that he was injured. He was having trouble with his ex-wife. He couldn't see his daughters. And then he ultimately took his own life. And, and I had quotes from the people that he trained with his students, 
Larry Papadopoulos, who is a pancreas guy and, and one of the pioneers of, of martial arts in Australia, kind of speaking about him as a person and him as a pioneer. Um, and they all spoke about him as someone who was so incredibly enthusiastic about martial arts, almost in, in a way like he, he used to be a mechanic and, and he decided he didn't want to be a mechanic anymore, so he was a bodyguard. And he basically oriented his life around martial arts training and seeing his daughters. So he would bounce at night, but his days were free so he could take care of his little girls and he could train as much as he wanted. He had mats in his basement and he would just, he would literally watch UFC and pancreas videos and then he'd come to the Taekwondo hall that he um, ran with his, his um, training partner and coach Ian Wright and he would be like, hey, I want to try this thing that I saw Frank Shamrock do in pancreas. You know, I want to I try this thing that Ken Shamrock did, you know. And they, they described him as someone who took to martial arts like a duck to water. For his community in Newcastle, he was far and away the best martial artist from, from that area. He really did earnestly want to make a living out of a sport that wasn't even a sport yet. Um, and I think just in terms of his tenacity and his, you know, he wasn't a natural athlete, but he was, everybody spoke about him as someone who could have really made something of it if he trained properly. Um, he's kind of pot bellied and bald in, in the video, but, but they explain he had trained for a couple of weeks when he initially applied to be part of the tournament and then they knocked him back and he stopped training and he was, you know, eating and drinking and, and all that sort of thing. And then he got told about two weeks, Hey, you might be an alternate. Um, and then he got, he jumped back into training, but it, you know, it was orders of magnitude, um, fitter when he initially thought that he was going to compete in it. And he still got to the second round. In, in a fight that was largely him just Homer Simpsoning it, you know, getting the absolute shit beaten out of him. <laughs> he was still able to, you know, he was still able to, to advance the round and he was still able to pull something like that. I think that just showed the depth of his, you know, self-belief and determination. So um, it, was, it was super sad. It was super sad. And he, one of the things that I went mad trying to figure out was the fight order because what happens on the VHS is not exactly how the fights played out in terms of sequencing. But mm -hmm. I confirm... He is the first Australian martial, mixed martial artist to compete in a mixed martial arts contest in Australia. Um, and because a lot of this information wasn't, did, didn't make it into the final um, iteration of the article, I will absolutely do a proper pioneers piece on him at some point in the future. Um, I just need to track down um, some of the other people's, people in his life. But I spoke to his coach, his training partners, at least one of his students or two of his students, um, and they all had nothing but good things to say about the guy. He was obviously very troubled, um, but he, he loved martial arts. He loved um, No Holds Barred. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a real loss that he wasn't able to go, get through that period in his life. I will look forward to seeing that piece. And by all means, let me know offline if there's anything I can do to help make it happen. Yeah, thank you. But, but that is a first that nobody will ever be able to take away from him. And while... Australia was, you know, forgive me, a bit of a backwater MMA wise for a long totally. time, yeah. you know, compared to its size, its population, its prominence in, in, in other sports. Like I say, mm -hmm. you know, probably as late as 2016, Chris Hazeman was still the greatest <laughs> uh, Australian mixed martial artist. Uh, but hey, you know, that is a piece of history that Neil Bodicott has and nobody one will ever be able to take away from him. Absolutely. Let's talk for a sec about Michael Chavello. One of the things that shocked me and will shock anybody who watches the embedded video of this event while reading the article is he's 21 years old. This is, I know that he had been announcing different things since he was a teenager yeah. and probably even some combat sports, but this is the first no holds barred event that Michael Chavello, one of the most recognizable voices in the industry, uh, ever announced what a finished product he sounds like his delivery is pretty close to what it's like now i heard at least one of his catchphrases already age 21 yeah, yeah. like he was so precocious like he was just so ahead of his time and and he spoke about another another thing that was cut from the article um he was obsessed when he was when he got the opportunity to do this commentating for like 300 dollars and and a uh, and a uh, um room at the, uh, I don't know, what is it, the bon Bondi Suite or whatever uh, on Bondi Beach. Um, he was obsessed. You know, he got all the VHS tapes. He got all of the Gracie tapes. He got all of the Black Belt magazines. And he was just trying to memorize, to commit to memory all of these moves 
that had you know were, were totally not within the Australian martial arts pantheon. Um, he, you know, was totally obsessed with preparing himself for this event. And there was some stuff that was cut after the fact. A lot of it was live, but some stuff was was done post production. And you notice that because in the original live broadcast, they were referring to it as the Australasian Ultimate Fighting Championship, whereas post production it was caged combat because of the lawsuit. Um, but yeah, he did an absolutely phenomenal job. And you're you're right. List, you listen to it, and you could think it could just as easily be overlaid on a one championship event or something like that. He really does sound uh, not noticeably different from his commentary now. And he actually said that a lot of his, uh, a lot of the innovations that Babel introduced for this event, like the aggresso meter, which was again, spoilers to people who, who are going to watch the embedded video. There is this graphic that comes up on the screen periodically throughout the fights. That's like from mortal Kombat, where it shows who's winning the fight based based on their aggression you know, if, if I'm winning the fight, then it's got like three quarters of it is green pointing to my opponent. Um, and, and he just, you know, he's crooning about the aggressor meter. Oh, look at the aggressor meter, Mark. Ah! It's, uh, <laughs> it, you know, he really, he really makes the event. He really, I, I think without Michael Chavello, without the ref cam, like it was the first event to use a ref cam. That's, that's something else that we haven't, we haven't mentioned. Uh, you know, it was so incredibly ahead of its time. And although. And because yeah, the sorry. ref's name was Cam, it was yeah, the Cam Cam. Yeah. Oh, this is fantastic! And Mark came up with that. That was his. That was his name. Um, it's so, uh, it's so goddamn fun. I mean, I watched this event, you know, three or four times in the end. Um, have reams and reams of notes on it. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think Michael, Michael, Michael made the event so much better than w what it otherwise would have been. Um, and yeah, it's you know, it, it's so cool that he was part of this. It it absolutely is. And if you listen now to something that. Mike Goldberg or Joe Rogan or Bruce Buffer was doing 20 years ago. They, yeah. in some case, like Bruce Buffer doesn't even sound like the same person. Yeah. Uh, or, I mean, hell, even uh, John Anik, like 10 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting just how consistent Chavello has been. Like, yeah, he's, he's so, he's so enthusiastic and it's just so incredibly infectious. Um, and I actually, I think the chemistry between him and Mark. Mark is a very straight down the middle guy, um, and and I think some of some of his jokes and some of his like he's not as naturally a charismatic and loquacious loquacious figure as Michael, but I think still their chemistry worked quite well. Um, I don't know how much uh, commentating Mark still does, um, but yeah, obviously Michael went on to do um, amazing things uh, in both kickboxing and mixed martial arts. Uh, and yeah, he was extremely giving of his time too. He was extremely enthusiastic. He spoke extremely high of Babel um, and, and just the whole operation. Um, you know, he's like, this is where it all started. You know, he, you know, he probably still would be where he is today. I don't want to credit Babel with like, you know, <laughs> changing the course of MMA commentary history, but um, certainly, yeah, this is an important, um, this is important chapter in his career. I'm, I'm glad you kind of pivoted to, to that because I wanted to do a little rundown of what some of these people are doing today, at least as regards combat sports. Some of them we've already yeah. covered, and obviously yeah. some of the more prominent fighters, it's already known. If you're yeah. watching this, you probably already know what Elvis Sinisek went on to do. You probably already know what Vernon White went on to do. You probably yeah. know that Mario Sperry went on to be one of the greatest heavyweight grapplers of all time. I mean, he already was then, but he went yeah. on to... Uh, formalize that by cleaning up at Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Uh, but to your knowledge, uh, what is Mark Castanini doing now? Like, is he doing anything uh, directly involved with combat sports? Yeah, yeah, he is. So he runs a very big, one of the best kickboxing, well, it's a total mixed martial arts gym, I think, but, it, it, I, you know, he's known for being a kickboxer, trainer foremost. Um, it's massive. It's in a suburb called Nunawading, about 40 minutes from where I live, which is um, very close to Melbourne City. Um, it's a massive gym. Um, it has, you know, hundreds of members. Um, it's it, it, He holds events too. I think he does some Warriors Way kickboxing um, promotions, uh, like he promotes his events through his gym. Um, he actually had a show, uh, interestingly, on, I want to say Fox Sports called Hammer, Hammer's Corner. Because um, his nickname from when he was a kickboxing champion was Mark the Hammer Casagnini. Um, and he had a show for, 
I think it was one season or two seasons. And then when the UFC signed the Fox deal and, and were streaming their events in Australia, they had a clause in their agreement that said, we, we are the only combat sports show um, on your network. So they actually, it meant that they did not re-sign Hammer's show. Um, but no, he's been a very successful um, coach, trainer, uh, entrepreneur in the space, I suppose, promoter. I don't know if he manages anybody. Um, but as a personality and as kind of like somebody who knows everyone and everything in martial arts in, in Australia, um, he's, he's kind of at the top of that list. So, yeah, Mark is still very much embedded in combat sports in Australia. And I will be talking to him for future stories as well because he's such a reserve of knowledge. His mind is like a steel trap. That is fantastic. To someone like me who is, I'm not Australian, I'm, I'm, I'm what you would apparently call a yank. I've, oh. I've picked that up from reading the article. I think of Elvis Sinisic as more or less synonymous with Australian mixed martial arts. You know, he was the first yeah. Australian in the UFC. Uh, and I know that, you know, he still works with the UFC. He's He's been a gym owner and trainer, both with and yeah. without uh, Anthony, Anthony Parash. Does, is he seen that way for Australians, at least Australians who are mixed martial arts fans? Yeah, yeah, I think I think he he's very rightfully kind of in the Australian, the unofficial Australian Hall of Fame of mixed martial arts, um, and he's someone who is as much a fan as a fighter. You know, anybody who follows Elvis Sinizik on Twitter knows that he watches every event. He's constantly doing fan polls. You know, who do you think won that round? What do you think about this matchup? Um, he's so enthusiastic, and he really engages. You know, the first time I interviewed him was I think maybe 2017 or 2018, after I hadn't been writing for Sherdog that long. And I just sent him a tweet um, or, or maybe I even he commented on one of my posts or something and we just got talking like he really engages with people. He's a real open book. Anybody who wants to speak to him, he's always very generous with his time. Um, he's a very committed um, trainer. He's known as, as one of the best coaches um, in New South Wales. Um, and yeah, everybody loves him. I don't know anybody apart from Chris Hazeman. I don't know too many people who have a bad thing <laughs> so to say. About. They, they've not buried the hatchet, I take it? Elvis sounded extremely conciliatory. I don't think he holds any grudge, even though he was kind of the person sustaining the grudge because he was always accusing Chris of uh, of being dirty in their first fight. Um, Chris seemed a little bit more, you know, and he he was the subject of the of the accusation about about being dirty. So I think he still holds a little bit of a gripe. He he published a absolutely hilarious series of articles in the Sydney Morning Herald, which is one of Australia's biggest broadsheets, like its establishment media before their rematch, which didn't end up happening, but when the rematch was still going ahead at UFC 110 in Sydney back in 2010, he like had this like running blog on the Sydney Morning Herald where he would basically just call Elvis a dipshit every week and just poke <laughs> at him and just be, you know, it's, it's hilarious. So yeah, I think, there's, I think there's still a little bit of animosity that, that Chris holds towards um, Elvis. But with, with that exception, everybody loves Elvis, you know? We... I have been talking for about an hour now about a piece that you clearly put, I'm going to guess, triple digit hours easily into between preparation, research, interviewing, and then cobbling the final product together with Sherdog editor at large, Josh Gross. Yeah. Is, I mean, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wish you were asked or anything that you, that you want to get out about this. I'm glad that we had uh, some time to talk about Neil a little bit, for example. Yeah. Um, let me, let me see. Let me, I jotted down some notes. I had to reread some stuff and relearn some stuff. Um, I think actually one of, one of the subplots that I thought was really interesting. And again, sort of a, something that if I had an unlimited amount of words, I probably would have explored or, or probably will explore in future pieces, but there was this small group of Australian no holds barred fighters who were pioneers because they competed in Pancras. You know, Pancras, uh, the, the first iteration of Pancras from the early 90s to the turn of the century, um, they had scouts that would go to places like Holland, Australia, New Zealand, America, um, and they would kind of set up these satellite. Not, not, not quite camps, but they would, they would go and get fighters who would compete in their regular schedule and kind of be the rivals to their Japanese and American stars. And there were five men, two of whom, no, three of whom spoke to me um, for this piece, um, who were kind of, you know, they described themselves as sacrificial lambs when, when they went over there. But 
nobody's told that story about these, you know, former AFL players, kind of like budding grapplers, security guards who went over and competed in, in Japan in like 1994. Um, uh, that was so fun learning about that. I knew about one of them, Larry Papadopoulos. He has a bit of a name around Australia. He was, I think, the most successful of the five who went over there. Um, some of them never never won a fight, um, but Larry won a few. Uh, and then he did some things in uh, UFO and possibly rings. He may have competed there for a little while. Um, but that was a really, really fun subplot because that was basically the baseline in Australian no holds barred. Because at that time, Chris had had, I think, one fight. He competed in the Alabama uh, martial arts reality series fight um, where he fought Bustamante and, and got um, submitted in all of, I think, a minute. Um, Elvis hadn't had any fights. Um, you know, it was really ground zero with these pancreas guys. And um, I think I'll, I'll do a piece on them one day if I can, if I can uh, track down the other two who I wasn't able to um, catch up for this piece. But I thought that was really cool. Like Larry, yeah, yeah. So the way Larry told this story was basically there were pancreas scouts in Australia trying to get people to, that they could bring over to Japan to compete against the, the, the sham, shamrocks and funakis um, of pancreas. And they were on the Sydney tram and within the eyeline of the tram was Larry Papadopoulos's martial arts dojo. And purely by chance, they saw Larry Papadopoulos competing and eventually went into the gym and asked them to spar and one thing led to another and some months later they jumped on a plane to go compete in pancreas they were paid five thousand dollars in cash in in these red envelopes um which one of the fighters krista weaver pointed out was not that much less than what ufc fighters are getting paid now and these guys definitely were not nearly at the level of um you know professional um, combat sports athletes back then um but yeah that, that that's how that started um, there were five, five in total. I think altogether they had about 30 to 35 fights between them. Their, their record, their cumulative record was something like 26 and five or something like that. Larry Papadopoulos was far and away the most successful. Um, but yeah, they, they described themselves as sacrificial lambs or cannon fodder. Um, but they went over there, they continued competing. They really enjoyed it. Um, and you know, I, I really want to explore that story. That might be another feature down the track. Um, to do in addition to one on Neil Bodicott as, as his pioneer status. These were the guys, you know, before, you know, potentially before the UFC even started. You know, this was like really early 90s. I think Pancreas started in sort of mid-1993. I'm not sure when their first fight was, but... Um, uh, Ken Shamrock had three fights in Pancreas before UFC won, so... Yeah. Yeah. Sometime in 1993 or maybe even mm -hmm. late 1992, Pancreas started. So, um, yeah, these five Australian dudes... Um, a couple of them don't really have anything. I don't, don't know if they have anything to do with martial arts anymore. Um, Larry Papadopoulos still does. Um, Alex Cook, I don't think has anything to do with martial arts anymore. Krista Weaver's back in, a sh back in America. And then the other two I didn't make contact with. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really fun story, um, that, that I got, you know, got to be aware of it through the process of writing this. And you mentioned that, Frank Shamrock and Vernon White being familiar with their exploits in Pancrase may have given them a misleading picture of what the best fighters in Australia in 1997 were really going to look like. Might have left them unprepared for a Chris Haseman. Yeah, totally, totally. And I mean, I, I think it was probably a fair assessment generally of the ground culture in Australia. We were a country that had uh, a lot of kickboxers, a lot of boxers who, who who were extremely talented and could hold their own on the international stage. You know, they won world titles and were very competitive. But our first BJJ black belts, I don't think, was crowned until 1998 or 1997, John Wills. Um, there really was not an established ground fighting culture in Australia. Um, so, yeah, they thought they thought that, you know, that was going to be the, the kind of people that they came across. Um, and then they got Chris Hazeman, who... You would have seen in the, uh, if anybody watches the video, he's a fucking big boy. He's, he's a big boy. He has good, you know, well-established wrestling. And he, he could just control people. I mean, the fact that he could um, stick his, his chin in somebody's eye and exert that much pressure that they have to submit, you have to control someone pretty damn effectively in, in order to be able to an extract a submission like that. So, um, yeah, uh, they definitely probably weren't expecting someone like Chris. I don't think anybody had heard of Chris at that point in time. He'd only had one fight against um, Bustamante in um, martial arts reality 
series fighting in Alabama like three or four months beforehand. Um, but, you know, he went on, to your point earlier, to become Australia's greatest fighter for a very long time. He held that mantle for, you know, over a decade. It's uh, it's also interesting that at least a couple of those, I'm just thinking of them as the sacrificial lamb five, uh, were Australian rules football players because that harks back to Babel saying that he was going to make this ultimate fighting thing bigger than Australian rules football, which for all the things that he kind of shamelessly ripped off the UFC, that yeah. predates Dana White saying that MMA was going to get bigger than soccer by probably a full decade. So that's yeah. one thing, one thing that, that he he did first did not have to, did not have to steal that was that sort of, whether you think of it as just hucksterism or just legitimate belief in yeah. this product he's got, but he had that in common. Yeah, absolutely. And the comparison that I, that I really thought right from the beginning when I learned who, who Randy Babel was, um, I compare him to Art Davey because they're always trying to sell you something. They're always sort of hustling. They speak extremely loquaciously. They're able to make something. They, they make you believe. You know, Randy Babel, 24 years after this event, is still trying to sell the idea of guys fighting in cages in Sydney, in, in the Sydney center. He is still trying to sell that vision. Um, and I think his background was very similar to Art Davey. Art Davey came from um, advertising. Uh, Randy Babel came from music promotion and commercial building. Um, they both set up these kind of sham uh, athletic commissions or sanctioning bodies to kind of placate regulators or skeptical media or politicians who are used to the sanctioning bodies in kickboxing and boxing. Um, and yeah, he made crazy claims. You know, he wanted to, he didn't just want to package this up into VHSs and put on crazy live events. He ultimately thought that he was going to change the pay-per-view industry in Australia and get live uh, mixed martial arts or no holds barred on pay-per-view, maybe even on live broadcast on the free-to-air television networks in Australia. And, you know, Renee Rivkin was apparently interested. P people in Australia um, who are older than me, uh, I didn't know who Renee Rivkin, Rivkin was until ben, Randy told me who, but he's got a pretty long uh, Wikipedia page. Uh, um, Renee Rivkin was a um, very, very famous stockbroker in the late 90s. He eventually got convicted for insider trading and committed suicide in the 2000s. But in 1997, he was like this Donald Trump-esque figure. He could make dreams come true. And apparently, he was interested in investing in mixed martial arts and, and apparently I'm, I'm told I couldn't find any um, like sort of primary evidence of this but he did have certain investments in the combat sports industry in the late 90s um, so you know if not for a few bad phone calls a few bad decisions um, maybe uh, Rene Rivkin would have kept this thing afloat and we would have seen caged combat two three four and five and you know who knows where it could have been by the turn of the century R regardless of you know why that didn't come out and you know we we started off this hour talking about some of the the near misses and how this might have been one of them and for all the things that were difficult and went wrong for Randy Babel and Australasian Ultimate Fighting Championship they were getting SEG at one of their most vulnerable points it yeah. to the point where apparently SEG's lawyers just stopped showing up for the Australian court dates cuz you know somebody had pulled the plug on their money it yeah. wouldn't have taken much of a push for things to go the other way, but from everything you're telling me, I suspect that Randy Babel is one hell of a real estate agent. Yeah, I think so. He's also he's he's a pilot as well. I think he just does like hobby flying, but he's got his own plane. So I think he did okay in the end. Uh, if he's got his own plane, he's probably you know doing better in real estate than I am in combat sports media. Seeing how I do not have a, a plane uh, parked yeah. outside, <laughs> but best of all for him his story and the story of his mixed martial arts promotion is finally being told in the, the way it deserves. I came to this, like I said, needing to be told and needing to, to be sold. You know, I'm, I'm shocked that I don't know about this event. Why should I care about it? And you let me know why I should care. And you did it through the voices of many of the people who were involved I said off the top of the show, and I will reiterate, it's one of the best pieces about combat sports, both in terms of its reach and scope and just the, the, the loving way in which it was put together. One of the best I've read in any format, any medium in several years. Uh, so it was an, an honor to have it uh, go up under the, the Sherdog banner. 
Anything else we need to say about this one? Anything we want to get out there? Just that if there is a independent filmmaker who likes mixed martial arts uh, and is in Australia, this is the kind of thing that I think lends itself to a, to a fantastic documentary. Um, and, you know, for the most part, all the principals are perfectly willing to talk about it. So, you know, I think that would be fantastic. But, um, yeah, it, it's been my absolute privilege to speak to you. It was my privilege to get to work on this piece and to get to put this event on the record um, because it w really was something special. And I'm, I'm so indebted to everybody who spoke to me, to the people who gave me the Blitz magazines, which I had to, you know, drive four hours to get to. Um, yeah, everybody who's um, played a part in contributing to this story and they're helping me tell it, um, I'm extremely indebted to. And I'm indebted to you for helping me talk about it and um, help Sherdog amplify it um, further than it's already gone. It has been my pleasure. I'm Ben Duffy. He is Jacob Debitz. You can find his work on the SureDog front page on pretty much a weekly basis and look out for his forthcoming book on the business and finances of mixed martial arts, which I now understand that he is working on with John Nash of Bloody Elbow. The John man. Nash. Yes. John Nash of Bloody Elbow, the man, if you want facts, figures and analysis about the money in this sport. And that is coming out. Give me a year. We're going to finish it this year. That's the aim. So I, hopefully it'll be on bookshelf somewhere. Uh, God willingly next year. Put me down for a pre-ordered copy as soon as you have a drop date. To everybody watching, thank you for listening. Enjoy the article. It will be uh, linked in the body beneath this video for SureDog.com. I'm Ben Duffy. Thank you.